All right. Good evening. How's everybody? Good? Happy to be here? Yeah, I am. Um, okay, so it is such an honor um, to be here with uh, Paul Preciado. Uh, Paul and I have been collaborators in lots of different events, mostly uh, part of the events that he sets up around Europe under the heading of uh, Parliament of Bodies. Um, and so I'm really excited to see this new book of essays. Many people here will know Paul from his pretty heavy-duty theoretical works uh, like Pornotopia, the Countersexual uh, Manifesto, and of course, Testo Junkie. Now, the essays that we're here to talk about this evening come from a really different context, and we'll get into that context uh, in a little bit. Um, but they're a book of occasional pieces that he wrote over the course of four or five years for um, the French newspaper Liberation. So they have a really, really different kind of focus, target, audience, impact. Uh, they're not subject to the sort of glacial time that academic writing is, where you think something one year and 10 years later it appears in print and no one cares anymore. Not true for Paul, of course, but uh, it, at any rate, you're publishing pieces uh, you know, in quick succession and making a real impact on the way that people talk about things. So I'm super interested um, tonight in ranging across a wide range of topics that have interested Paul and being part of the, um, the things that he's written about over the years. But I also want to ask him and get a sense from him um, about this new book. And one thing that occurred to me, just to, to jump right in here with a question, uh, is that Paul is a very, very strong manifesto writer. And I don't know if you know anyone here has ever tried to write a manifesto. I sometimes give this as an assignment to my students, and then they write horrendous things that you're just like, oh, God, you know, don't publish that anywhere. Um, because it's, it's very difficult to get the tone of the manifesto right, because you, you have to be able to see through the political implications and see where they would run. Paul has uh, written a manifesto, the countersexual manifesto, and a lot of the essays in this book have a kind of countersexual or, or a manifesto punch to them. So I just want to read you a little quote and then ask uh, about the politics of the manifesto. So in one essay, Paul writes, I am a dissident of the sex gender system. I am the multiplicity of the cosmos trapped in a binary political and epistemological system shouting in front of you. And then he continues that he wants to bring news not from the margins, but instead offer us a piece of the horizon. Okay, so I wanted to ask Paul uh, as an opener um, to talk about this method of offering us a piece from the horizon, uh, shouted in the mode of a manifesto and distributed widely. What is, what is this uh, piece of the horizon? Okay, well, first, uh let me say just uh, hello to all of you. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. I was like so surprised that so many people would come. And uh, so I want to say thank you and welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and especially the rest. And, uh, and thank you so much, uh, the organizers of the event, for having us. My editor, Jax, that I don't know might be in the audience somewhere and that actually did a great um, job like uh, translating the book, editing the book with me and everything. And of course, Jack, that has been, I mean, for me, is more than a friend. Uh, I, even though we are like not separated, you're not so much older than me, but he was already writing beautifully when I was just like a teenager or whatever, right? So I kind of grew up like, uh, you know, like, but do you remember when we first met? Yes, it was funny. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because we were in San. I was in Santa Cruz, and this, you know, I was a, a young professor, and yeah. he comes up with the, a manifesto that he shoves into my hands, believing that I would be able to read French well enough to read it, <laughs> which was already a fantasy. And I was just like, he's cool, you know. That's that's great. And then the next thing I know, I'm like, I actually did struggle through that book in French. I was like. Actually, this is kind of amazing, but we didn't meet again yes. for, for I know, a long for time. Like and you were already Mr. Testo Junkie. No, then. I don't know. I don't know. 
No, at that time, honestly, I was I was really at that time working on on prostheses and and on uh, uh, let's say non-binary, deviant, ill, sick sexuality, right? Like the kind of sexuality that we uh, the the non-normal practice and 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 have and whatever. So and I was I really wanted to work on that, but at that time the, it was the the gender upheaval of the university. So everyone was really speaking about gender. No one wanted to speak about so much about sexuality. Sexuality was a little like ugly, and those were like the after after the eight years. So you were supposed to be like you know gender was very good to talk about, but not sexuality. And uh, yes, so I, I went to this event and I, I met you, and you know among other people like Donna Haraway you were also like kind of incredibly inspiring to me and also I really wanted to be like you at that time you know I and this can be stupid but it's, it's true and it's important in the sense that for instance and I uh, my cousin is here today so she knows what I'm speaking about I'm I'm I was born in Spain in a, in a uh, society that was still under under the Franco fascist regime so for me thinking that someone like me that had been uh, the object of so much repression and uh, just like uh, being treated as a sick or ill person from the beginning, from the, the time I was a child, because I was at that time being said to be a lesbian, um, thinking that I had the possibility not only to produce knowledge, but also to uh, pretend that that knowledge would be recognized by the academy. And I saw other, like, you know, weird people, like queer fellows doing that. And it was, it was, this was unbelievable. This was like a political dream for me. And this also might explain some, some kind of, some many of the conversations that we always have, Jack and myself. Because Jack is always telling me like how you're op so optimistic, you know? You're so optimistic. But how can you be when you've been born in a, in a uh, fascist society? You know, uh, you need to be optimistic because you, you need to believe that things can be changed. Otherwise, there is nothing that you can do, right? Otherwise, yeah. so... Um, but that's so, so interesting, Paul, because, you, you know, um, to, to think about the fact that you, you literally grew up in a fascist yeah. dictatorship, you know, and so you're, you're able to then recognize some of the structures that have come back around in a way that's quite unique, it seems. And I do think these essays are quite preoccupied with a, the, the new versions of fascism that are upon us. Well, I don't know if it's unique. I think that what is not unique is the, the American and the uh, Northern Europe vision of things. Because while America and Northern Europe were in a kind of, a, let's say, democracy dream, whatever we want to think about that, the rest of the world, we were struggling through basically most, most of us moving from fascism, not into democracy, but into neoliberalism. So we never got to, ne to know uh, what freedom was. We went from uh, a fascist regime into uh, straight into neoliberalism. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, I think that that's the place where I'm coming from, and which is, even though people, I mean, you see me and you think I, I'm white, and now it's even worse, because you think that I'm, I mean, that now, then we can speak about these complexities, you know, because I'm, I'm suffering from this, like, uh, uh, this kind of bi biopolitical fiction that I have become of myself, because people now might think that, uh, that I'm white, uh, male and straight, which is even worse. You know, I have to do, <laughs> I have to do, I, some, I have to do something. But I, I, I mean, please help any anyone. You know, because <laughs> I, I, I spend my time saying like not exactly what you think I am, right? So, um, and what? How how do you signify that? You know. You're trans. Do you just tell people, or in my case, I think because I'm I'm really shy. I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm someone that is, I'm not so comfortable with my body. Not because I'm trans. I think the trans part is the only thing that I like about it. <laughs> it's the rest that I'm not so, so happy about it. Like, I don't know, the embodied condition is difficult. It's a difficult one. Um, you know, so, so yeah, um, because of that, I, I'm not so funky uh, looking or whatever. I think that is, is language that, uh, that for me is, is uh, 
you know, I'm, sometimes I feel that I'm possessed. Like, for instance, I would be, uh, now this is a kind of a, something that should remain between us. But sometimes I'm, I, I, I don't know. Just the 100 of us. I'm on, on, yes, on a board, for instance, of a museum, and I know there will be people that are like, you know, like the, the trustees from the museum that will come, and then I feel immediately pro possessed by Beltor Brecht, and I, I, I start like speaking like Marxist theory, like I'm, I'm like, could you shut up? Like, and this is not the moment, right? So I think that that's, you know, I, I, the drug thing for me is language. It's always like I'm, it's, and I think that that's what I, uh, my, my survival technique yeah. is being like, uh, basically has been constructed through saying what I was not allowed to say and at the beginning writing it and then like really saying it. And you know, in, in the, uh, some of the essays in An Apartment on Uranus, and we'll get to the title uh, eventually, I'm sure, um, uh, y you know, you, you compare your experience at Borders um, as a trans person with uh, documents. For a long time, you were circulating throughout Europe with documents that didn't match your appearance. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it seems like you, you kind of use these disorienting experiences to then think about and relate to uh, the, the massive crisis around refugees and migrants in Europe. And there's a lot of material, um, and I just wanted to um, read from one of the essays to give you a sense of how it is that Paul is ma managing to pull queer and trans theory into a very productive dialogue with questions around migration and uh, refugees. So he has a beautiful essay called the place that welcomes you. And he, he has a strategy he's using in this essay called anaphora, where you repeat the first part of the sentence over and over again. I mean, th and this is the, s the kind of writing that um, the, the essays, makes the essays really sparkle uh, in this volume. So he, he writes, it's called the place that welcomes you. It's the Mediterranean. It's the place you come to. It's Greece. It's the place that welcomes you. It's the ground that could be under your feet. It's the sea that drowns you. It's Europe. It's the sky that seems to be the same for everyone, but isn't. It's the world. And this is not a kind of we are the world statement. It's, a, that, that it's about being completely uh, alienated in the world and what that experience might be both on the micro scale of being in a trans body and moving through border control, but also on a macro scale in terms of these uh, movements of uh, refugees across the globe, and particularly in Greece, where you yeah. were located. Yeah, well, first I have to say that I, um, I didn't transition as uh, other people maybe do, that they, they think I'm gonna, I'm gonna become trans from the beginning and then uh, you, you go within the, let's say, both legal, psychiatric and medical path in, in order to transition. I think if people read here uh, Testo Junkie, you know that this was more like a, kind of a, a philosophical experiment for me, like, you know, I, I, I set myself this uh, kind of contract with myself that I said, I'm gonna uh, start taking testosterone. Still, I wanted to take testosterone. It was not like, you know, I want to do anything. No, no, I really wanted to take testosterone uh, because many of my friends at that time were taking it. I, it was, I had already like a lot of testosterone in my house. So, you know, we, I started, as shamans would say, testosterone started to talk to me, you know, and then I, and then I had to answer, but I said like, okay, okay, I'm coming back. Um, so, yes, so basically that's, that's how I, I started uh, transitioning. Uh, more like really trying to think or trying to uh, to, to experiment self-transformation, transformation of my political identity and writing about it at, at the same time and then doing a political genealogy of hormones and so on, right? But, um, but I didn't want to go into the medical system and accept the uh, gender dysphoria uh, label and then go through the medical system and so on. That was, that was my initial, again, very utopian idea of things and very conceptual and philosophical and whatever. And then I, was, then I got into this intimate conversation with the testosterone that was calling me. And things started to change because that, as, as transformation started to happen, um, I, I 
got to understand things that I could have not imagined just by thinking about them. Like basically when my body was perceived differently from the outside and so differently than then uh, my passport became obsolete. And, um, and then the, the, I, I started to think much more about the, the logic of representation that we all work with. For instance, like for the government, you are a number. That's what you are. You are a name and a number and eventually a document, an administration file, that's what you are, right? So if at a certain point, the representation techniques that are being used to uh, identify your body are not able to fully recognize who you are, then you feel, I mean, you immediately fall into a, a basically a kind of a legal gap a uh, political gap, and you lose your identity, let's say legal identity, because I'm not speaking here about identity in the sense of uh, poli identity politics, but you, you lose uh, citizenship, um, legal rights, right? And this is exactly what, what uh, happened to me, exactly at the same time that I had been appointed, I accepted this position of uh, being curator for Documenta, and I started to travel all around the world, which I think it was very important because otherwise, um, I, it, you know, being I wonder if a contemporary philosopher can be at home. You know, I don't think we are home anywhere anymore. That's it's impossible. We're not at home. It's like we're homeless. We are the homeless. Uh, you know, all of us uh, in, on earth. Um, so I think was very important for me to be on the road and to be moving and to be uh, not not to have a house and then t in a sense my my body became my homeless condition as well because even my body could not be my house uh, since it was not recognized by the legal system by uh, the administration system so I, I I was like crossing borders with this passport that constantly uh, basically show me that I, I was, as I, I, I will explain to you maybe l later if you want, uh, in between two epistemological regimes, I found myself, well, I just like a stepping into somewhere without really being yet into another epistemological regime. And the, the, this condition is basically that I'm, I'm losing uh, legal status, right? So, um, and then I realized that this was exactly the condition that hundreds of thousands of people were already having, even much, much worse than mine, because I, I still I have a European passport, maybe a useless one at that point, but it still was European, which was something. Not right? as useless as a British passport, I'll just say. <laughs> Well, let me. T I, well, true, true. These days, things are becoming complicated, yeah. right? Totally yes, exactly. So, I, I think that that was a, let's say, um, a moment for me to actually, as well, kind of negotiate utopia as well. You know, in the sense that I had to, I really had to go back to the medical system and then say, well, okay, I accept. Uh, being called um, gender dysphoric, I accept. Uh, I'm gonna sign all these pages. I'm gonna get a lawyer. Uh, okay, I'm gonna uh, let's let me think. I have to think of a male name now, uh, and and I'm gonna change my gender on legally, right? right? So, but but changing the name gave you. You went through a few different names, as yes. many of us do. And you you. I think you were one of the first uh, people that actually know. The new, the, the new name that I wanted to, yeah. to have, and then maybe you can... Right, and then yeah. Paul wrote an essay, writes an essay in the, in the collection about the fact that he took on uh, Subcomandante Marcos's name uh, from the Zapatistas to... Again, like utopian. Utopian, okay. right? And one <laughs> it's, it's a pathology at this point, you know? I'm, saying, I'm the only one that I might agree with, you know? And utopia gets you into trouble because, yes. of course, Latin American activists and trans people were like, 
no, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. We don't want a some Spanish yes. trans guy taking on yes. the identity of a Mexican revolutionary. Yes. Yeah, the whole, I think, I mean, this issue of basically like changing my name, uh, it's been so, uh, so important. And so uh, I, I learned so much through it. And I've been written, uh, writing like many, many other things about this. And eventually this will become a book. Um, but what you see in the, in an apartment on Uranus is really the process through which I'm going. First, because I really wanted to, at the beginning, I wanted to keep my quote unquote female name. Beatrice was was my my previous name, which which basically I have to say, which for me is important that within the medical system and with many trans movements now, the that name is basically never to be mentioned. No, my name is my name, and I will take it at the, up to the end. No one will strip it off from me. It's my name. I I want it. It has like part of my my history is there, part of my oppression is there, and only myself can I decide if I want it take it down. And I, I'm saying this because basically the, the when I was going through the, the legal process of changing my name, the judge in Spain was horrified by the idea that I will keep uh, Beatrice as a second name. I mean, the, the B that you see, like uh, Paul B is really Beatrice. And, and that was for the judge, like, Oh, I mean, the worst, like an aberration that could happen. He actually, he looked at me, did a kind of masculinity test, and he said like, you a good guy, right? And, and okay, we will give you the name Paul, like basically we, the state and royalty and heavens and lords and everything will give you this name, but Beatrice, yeah. what is this for, right? right? And I said, no, you're not gonna give, well, I didn't say it because my lawyer was like kicking my, my, <laughs> <laughs> my lawyer was telling me like, shut up, you know, it's like not the moment to speak to the, to the judge, you don't talk to judges, right? So I was like trying for once in my life not to speak up. And, uh, so what, what do you think about, uh, like in the US in particular, people use this term of dead naming when someone's birth name is revealed and, and, and you know, I, I mean to me it's like I, I don't identify with that. Uh, that category well, and I think it really depends. Like you, I hold on to my name. You know, my names are my names. Yeah, I mean, I really think it depends. For instance, uh, throughout recently, uh, for the, um, the the day against uh, violence against women, I wrote a piece uh, in in the newspaper in Spain, in El País. And this piece was called uh, Heterosexuality is Dangerous, and it was really about heterosexuality, right? I mean, as a political regime. We can talk about that later, right? But in any case, this, this piece uh, was very controversial. I mean, for us, uh, honestly, it's a very simple, uh, decent piece that says that, yes, heterosexuality is dangerous, right? Uh, <laughs> fine. But for, for El País and especially for the right-wing movements that are now coming back after like, you know, like 25 years of neoliberalism and like being a little bit like um, trying to um, pretend they were not there, they're coming back. And then, uh, so it was a big campaign and it was an accusation and even they, it was a process uh, against the peace and everything. And uh, what was funny for me is that the, the right-wing refused to use my name and they would refer to constantly as Beatrice. And then uh, with with my lawyer, when we had to say like, excuse us, but my legal name is, uh, you know, is Paul. So if you, you, you keep using that name Beatrice, it's like, you know, you refer to someone that was before because now this is my legal name, right? So I think that there are also very violent ways of, of using your, let's say the name that was assigned to you when you were born. Uh, and I think it's very different what I what I intend to say when I say that I, I claim the right to keep my name as part of my, my political history. That's one thing. Another thing is, of course, like when someone will erase Paul as a possibility of being, as a multiplicity in becoming, as as just like a a, nom, a, a kind of a challenge to the binary regime, even by Paul Beatrice together, and just refer to my old name. And I think that that's what a lot of people, a lot of trans people are suffering as well. Like basically, you know, and I, I think that that can also happen to you. And yeah, yeah. Yes. No, totally. Yeah. It's the yeah. the. I mean, that's where the whole 
notion of dead naming comes from, the refusal to recognize you after you yes. know, through your transition. Basically. But you know what I'm interested, what for me is interesting about this issue of dead name and, and so on, is that, and maybe some of the people that are here in the audience, you don't know about it, unless you have gone through a, through a legal uh, gender change recently. I, and I don't know exactly how is the legal system here in the UK. Maybe you can add on that. But at least, for instance, in Spain, where I did it, uh, the legal conditions and administrations right now are such that when you change your name and gender status, uh, your birth certificate is destroyed, right? Because basically the system cannot accept that a change is being made on gender through your life, during, during your life. Right? So in a sense, what the, the uh, legal system is doing is pretending that the old person died and then they reissue a new birth certificate that of course, in my case, for instance, I was born, I can tell you anyway, I mean, I mean I, whatever, I'm, I was born in 1970, so I'm almost 50, hello. Um, <laughs> I'm, but yeah, so basically what, what they do is like they re reissue a new birth certificate that actually has the, the date of 1970, but it was issued in 2016, with exactly with that day and that signature. So I, I mean, my first birth certificate now is is the the most uh, I think the, the most exemplary um, case of the contradictions of the, the binary system that we're living in, right? Like, but, and I think that that's what is for me interesting about this dead name thing as well, is that, well, it's not just the trans community that are, is speaking about the, the dead name, is that yes, the regime and the system want us dead in a sense. There's, it's a part of us that should die in order for us to be recognized as just a man, for instance now, right? Right, so that, that's the way in which the bureaucracy can only operate Operate with a binary exactly, system in place, exactly, yeah. and it's enforced as such. And this is um, this sort of leads me to uh, an episode that you relate in the book that I, it really made me laugh out loud, um, actually, because it, it shows the way in which you not only reveal the contradictions and um, the absurdity of state bureaucracies, but you actually revel in uh, refusing their epistemological uh, structures. So it's a funny, it's a story where uh, Paul is invited to an event in Lyon to talk on the topic of the courage to be yourself. Remember this one? Yeah. Which, you know, already you're like, ah, you know, gag, this just... Of course, yes. They invite, only, they invite only women and me, and they invite, if possible, like Jewish or Moroccan or Arab women, that all of them have a lot of courage, right? Right, so it just takes courage to be the crazy thing that you are, whatever it is, right? Um, and so he, he gives a speech in which he says to his host, but when will you get sick of sitting down facing our courage as if you were attending entertainment? When will you get sick of making us the other so that you can be yourselves? And then he decides, he, he explains to his host that it's important to reject courage um, and suggests to his host that they should lack courage with him. And you know, to me this is, it speaks a little bit to, um, I think it was Butler's last book. Who knows? There are so many. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was it The Dispossessed or the one before? Yeah. You know, but the, the politics of vulnerability, yes, basically. Yes, yes. And you've, you've said a couple of times tonight, I'm so shy. I mean, we don't experience you as shy. Um, maybe you're shy or in French or Spanish. I'm not sure. No, uh, no. It's not a question of language. Right. I, I'm, it's I'm, your disposition. Well, I don't. I'm shy, like uh, as as a uh, ordinary walking person on the street. Yeah. Right. Yes. But I think that it, it, the the shyness, uh, coupled with the strident way in which you are trans in a binary world, gives you a certain kind of insight into the power of fragility and vulnerability, that I think is connected to some of the arguments that Butler is making, about the way in which we have to have a solidarity. 
um, that crosses uh, identity formations and that is based not upon these old nationalist sentiments around courage, fortitude and so on, but is based upon vulnerability. Uh, and particularly in an age of right-wing resurgence and populism um, and the, the various regimes, the anti-gender movement that you talk about quite a bit in, in the book, this is a great you know, topic to, to think through, a, a, a solidarity built around vulnerability. So I just wanted to ask you about that because there's a lot in the book um, about um, solidarity. Um, you know, We heard it in that uh, passage that I read about the place that welcomes you, but you also speak, you say, um, in relationship to the collective that you define as the ill-born, the stateless, the non-peoples, the ones still being invented, the non-political communities whose sovereignty exceeds the limits of power, the silent bodies of the world who do not even qualify as a people. Mm. What does it mean to speak with those groups um, and how do we avoid speaking for? I don't know, I think that maybe this also has something to do, now that I'm here in England, uh, with being from from Spain, being from the South, you know, because I think that uh, the identity politics politics movements that we know and that have been shaped through the 60s up to now, in a sense, they they also be fully uh, constructed and created within uh, mostly American and uh, Anglo-Saxon neoliberal politics, right? So, I mean, those movements were great, but um, I think also we need to question those movements because in a sense, uh, maybe, yes, we have, we have obt obtained and produced more identity. So in a sense, we are like more homosexual, we are more lesbian. I don't know if we are more lesbian because lesbian is a kind of a difficult thing. Well, we can speak about that as well. I think it's an, it's an interesting, lesbian is an interesting thing. Precisely because the, the difficulty of uh, pinpointing that even into an identity politics, or even though now it's becoming a little bit more, but for a long time was almost like kind of a rest that I was a little bit outside. But I think that from the from the 70s up to here, um, most of the revolutionary struggles that, I mean, the, the, the revolutionary force of the 70s was enormous, and nevertheless, all that uh, force was channel and kind of uh, shape and transform into identity politics through the logic of identity politics. And then I think that many of these um, of uh, of these struggles have uh, taken us to, uh, I mean, for some of us, positions that I cannot even imagine. Like how could we think about like all this revolutionary force of the, not just 60s, but if we think about the anti-colonial movements of from the Haiti revolution to the uh, decolonial movements and the sexual politics and so on. How can we think about all that revolutionary struggle being transformed into uh, a struggle for marriage and adoption? I mean, what happened there? And I think that what happened there was identity politics, was basically like, um, and for me that's, it's, it's, this is something that you will find in, in the book in the sense that um, I think that there are two ways of looking at things. One would be, okay, we, we, still, uh, we still could organize ourselves and our organize our struggles through the prism and the logic of identity politics. And then we go into all kinds of problems. Like for instance, are trans women or not? And then we can go for years on that discussion and it will be extremely violent and uh, and you know, and we could continue with 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 those, and they uh, they change and they reshape, and we could add like more and more identities. That could be one one way of uh, of thinking about this this political struggle. And for me, that way of thinking about it will be, I would say, uh, neoliberal democracy, and very much within the hegemonic framework of American politics. And the other way is a much more revolutionary way, and it, it would be what I, I call a uh, somatopolitical revolution. It would be, uh, instead of fighting for identity, starting to build and to think and to invent 
practices of critical disidentification. And this is not something new. I mean, I'm saying something. I'm really working here on, on, on work that has been done for ages. You've been working on that. Um, Jose Munoz, both beautiful friend of us that died, uh, was working on that a lot. Teresa Loretis. I mean, there are a lot of people, Audrey Lord, a lot of people have been really working on, on that. So instead of uh, putting our energy as a collective uh, on shaping and constructing identity, rather like inventing collectively, and I'm saying collectively, I think this is super important, inventing collectively strategies and techniques of disidentification, critical disidentification. And then I'm not, and this is why I have, maybe I don't know if we will have a discussion here, but I'm not so much, I mean now, I mean, I don't know if you're coming from from theory, from politics, from the arts, from uh, music, from I don't know, from whatever you're coming from. But um, in, within the uh, social sciences, for instance, now this inter in intersectionality thing became very kind of, a, you know, uh, fashionable, right? Like basically, well, you have to work on class, on gender, on sexuality, and a little bit of everything and so on. But nevertheless, class is class, gender is gender, sexuality is sexuality, and uh, we all know what it is. We know what is class, we know what is gender, we know what is sexuality, and then we have to, you know, it's like a kind of a sociological trick that at least from a philosophical point of view, I think is, is just ridiculous and it doesn't work. Because for me, the issue is like, it's not really thinking about these identities, not even like gender as, as a kind of a, you know, as a um, line of a identity production or even oppression, but rather thinking about the political regime, the patriarchal colonial heteronormative political regime that is constructing the body extracting, like capturing the, all the political, physical, emotional, effective energy of the body and shaping it, transforming it into identity. So the taxonomy of identity is precisely one of the things that we should be fighting against instead of uh, trying to form our struggles or like, you know, like reshape our struggles within this model of identity. So instead of identity politics, I'm claiming in this book for this, for inventing, and that's what I'm, I'm so close to the arts because I don't think there is a, a, a kind of a, a formula for this. This is an, a matter of invention. It's a collective invention and therefore, yes, politics is an art, which I'm not speaking here about like basically these stupid things is like that, that happen in museums, which is suddenly like artivism and then you show artists that are political. I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking as politics as being a realm of invention, of radical invention, and therefore experimental, experimental. That's what is great about queer culture, that we've been experimenting, like really struggling for life, and at the same time experimenting and trying out other ways of living, right? So instead of identity, uh, strategic techniques of critical disidentification, and maybe instead of identifying as gay, lesbian, whatever, now the list can be like so long, trans, whatever, which doesn't mean that we're not trans, gay, lesbian within those political taxonomies that are producing us. Yes, but we don't have to identify with those. You understand what I mean? It doesn't mean that violence is not shaping us as lesbians, uh, gay, yes, fine. But we do not have to struggle according to that, those identities. Maybe we could, we could struggle just from the point of view of being a living body on Earth. And I think that's why Uranus is like so crucial. Because the question of just becoming conscious that we are earthly, living and therefore mortal and vulnerable bodies. That's all the business that it is. Philosophically, I, I cannot see anything else going on, you know? And I don't see That's any how we end up on Uranus, just I, saying. Well, no, no. Which in English sounds different. No, just no, no, no. The, the Uranus, I mean, I have to say, in English, this uh, title 
gave me a lot of trouble. <laughs> As you can, in other languages, not really, even though the anus is there, like in all languages, I have to say, but in, in English it's much stronger. So for instance, my editor and other editors, like and the, my American editor and my uh, British one, uh, called me and said like, you know, Paul, I think that unfortunately this title is like, you know, it's so ugly, it doesn't look good, I mean. <laughs> and, but I have to, first, I mean, there is no way that I could relinquish that, that title, right. and I will explain you why. And second, uh, when we speak about vulnerability, because I like the bat battler's idea of vulnerability, but it's still super clean. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's very clean. It's very beautiful. Vulnerable beauty, like we're so vulnerable. We're not vulnerable, like no, we're dirty, uh, ugly, sick, anally, uh, shit. That's what we are. That's what life is about, right? So it's not vulnerability in the kind of a, because I, you have to know that uh, I also come in from a very um, Catholic background that my uh, cousin also knows about. <laughs> so um, we come from a very, very Catholic background. And of course, we know what is in there, right? Like the, yes, exactly. All what is fluids exactly. make their way into yeah, the yeah, Catholic exactly. cosmology. Well, that thing, but also... As the, does utopianism of a certain kind. Yeah, maybe. That's maybe, maybe. where we have yes, to worry about yes. the Christianity. No, but exactly. So, so I think the, the anus, finally, I think is quite interesting because it's also, of course, it's very much related to... Uh, the idea that heterosexual normative reproductive sexuality had in the 19th century, I, let me just like say this again, in the 19th century, no, in the sense that I just want to say today for everyone that is coming here that heterosexuality doesn't exist anymore, okay? Doesn't exist anymore. It disappeared. It was, uh, it completely, was completely destroyed, this heterosexuality as the, the continuity between sexuality and reproduction was destroyed when the, uh, the pill was invented and commercialized in the 1950s, right? So from that point on, whenever we're speaking about heterosexuality, I don't know exactly what is the parody where we're speaking about, right? So I think um, when I say that homosexuality doesn't exist, I'm not saying like that in favor of, well, heterosexuality does, no. I think that those notions belong to the biopolitical regime of the, let's say between the 17, late 17th century and especially 19th century uh, politics of reproduction of the nation that intended that every and single sexual act will be also a reproductive art. But with the invention of the, uh, of the, the pill, I, I think that this fully disappear and we enter into a new regime that that's what I call as opposed to the disciplinary regime of the 19th century, pharmacopornographic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want, if you, if, if some of the people here are still believing that they're heterosexual and I might, I might, um, you know, disrespect their condition, you can say you're like pharmacopornographic heterosexuals. It, it, you know, that will, will make you feel better. You know, um, <laughs> And I, I mean, I'm not going to argue about heterosexuality at all. I, it, it's, def it's not only done, uh, it's not only over because of the invention of the pill, which of course means that the whole reproductive alibi for the naturalness of heterosexuality disappears, but it's even gone in relationship to the success of marriage. I mean, we know that people don't stay married and that marriage is not particularly desirable to young people anymore anyway. So the forms that supported heterosexuality are also gone. Uh, the couple form is in disarray and, and so on. But a couple of things about, about Uranus just before we move yes. on from there. Well, and then we'll exactly. Get into I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't tell you about, yes, I didn't tell you finally why, why the book is called this way. Well, like, but but did, it's also, it's kind of a great planet for people who don't know. Uh, I mean, I think it's called the cold planet. It's, it's a kind of inversion of what we think of as a planet. It's on a tilt. So where south should be, north is. Uh, and instead of having the rings around it, the ring goes the other way. So it's the whole planet is tilted. It's called a sideways planet. So it has, you know, within it, the symbolics of Uranus are great. But then there's probably another reference that you don't know okay. that's very dear to me, which comes from the great film um, Dude, Where's My Car? I'm 
not sure if people are familiar. Sad to leave, I don't know about the film. <laughs> I'm sure they've all seen it or they probably yeah, don't remember it? because most people watch it when they're very stoned, but I don't, didn't. I watched it uh, completely sober. So, um, But there's a moment at the end of the film where the dudes, Ashton Kutcher and this other guy, have saved the universe. And... There are two, you remember, right? Um, they've saved the universe from a time glitch, and uh, which is why they never remember where their car is. The day keeps starting again over and over. But two gay clones keep appearing from outer space. And finally, at the end, they've saved the world, and the gay clones appear again, and they said, oh, my God, uh, um, we're here. You've saved the world. We're here at your disposal. The mysteries of the universe are yours to know. What would you like to ask? And the two sort of look at each other uh, for a moment, and they, then they giggle, and they say, have you ever been to Uranus? Oh, wow. And then this turns into a, what a hilarious joke. Have you ever been to Uranus? Right. <laughs> so it becomes a centerpiece. <laughs> This it's is like great. a Benny Hill moment in a very wow. stupid stone of film. Now, the good thing about Uranus is that everyone... In every different, I mean, now the book is translated in many languages and so on, and in every context, there are like Uranus stories. Right. And all right. of them are quite um, unbelievable and, and queer as well, right? So, well, thank you for that, that uh, Uranus thing, yeah. Right, well, and so you, there you are in your apartment on Uranus. Well, no, actually, um, this, well, this, the whole thing of the apartment on Uranus uh, came f also from a, another contract that I gave to myself. And I think, well, and you don't know me a lot, but from my writing, this issue of like establishing like a, a games of language or contracts, you can call them with myself, is a, is a long uh, practice of mine. So I, I decided to um, to trust my my dreams and to very much like to avoid uh, the uh, the privilege of psychology and psychoanalysis uh, to be able to interpret those dreams because I think that that's is, is quite amazing the way in which uh, the realm that for s now we're not going to discuss it even though we could be discussed for hours but what has been historically called the unconscious has been fully uh, territorialized and occupied by psychology, medicine, and uh, psychoanalysis, right? With uh, with all the problems that this entails. First, of course, like the a binary regime that is like there and is uh, you know extremely strong. The active, passive, the uh, normal, and the pathological, heterosexual and homosexual, all that, right? And then, I mean, things that are that I'm working on now for for my new book, but that had to do with the uh, the Oedipus complex is like how in hell I mean how in hell can we keep working as a therapeutical I'm not thinking about like a, a kind of fictional story like to you know have a joke like with a, in a film no I'm a, a critical therapeutical technique the Oedipus complex <laughs> okay I like yeah I like to make a stop there because I think it's you want Yes, I think it's I think it's very important. Like basically, that said that some of, some of the uh, the main technologies of uh, management of subjectivity that had been produced within the disciplinary regime, but then kind of transformed into the last 20, 30 years, they still use some of these un completely unquestioned uh, myths and fictions, right? Like like the simply like this fantastic story of a guy that takes. His balls are, I mean, eyeballs, excuse me. Balls. That was like, <laughs> things had to work, that we don't have a, a psychoanalyst here. Like, you know, but, it, well, so basically. The psychoanalysis, <laughs> not so dead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, well, when, so basically the whole thing started for me when, when I was in the, the, uh, the process of trying to look for a name. What does it mean to be named? Who has the right to own a name? Who can give you a name? What, uh, how are names given? Then suddenly, you know, like basically the people that I was working with at the, at the museum and different museums, I wanted them to use the name Beatrice but gender me in male form. And they get into a kind of grammar, uh, you know, like short circuit. They were like, no, 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 we can't. This is crazy. We're not able to do it. So at a certain point, they asked me, they say, like, please give us a, a male name because we are, like, confused. And then I said to them, like, well, guys, if you want a, a, a male name, then you look for it and you give it to me, 
right? Because some, I mean, you have someone has to find this name. I'm not going to find one. And then they came with impossible names like Orlando, like Moise, like things that I said. Not in a million years I want to. I will be able to use those names, right? So, and this is how at the end, um, basically, I I decided to. I called a friend who's a Bolivian feminist who is also a shaman. And it's an artist, it's an artist, let's say, an artist that is like working with many different techniques. And I, I said to her like, well, would you help me to, to find a name, right? So we did a big ritual that was super beautiful, but at the end she said to me like, well, the name will come to you in a dream. And I said like, okay, thank you for this ritual. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so basically, yeah, and then, for I forgot about. I mean, I was waiting for the for the name to come in my dreams for like maybe two months or something like that. Nothing happened, and then when I had totally forgotten about the the ritual, the dreams, and everything, one night I had this dream in which basically uh, they had found the uh, the the poetry writings of uh, Karl Marx. And those writings were like so extensive and unbelievable that uh, made the, the theory work of Marx look like ridiculous, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they decided to actually pub republish, republish the whole work uh, uh, on the light of those poems. And then someone in the dream said to me, well, maybe you wanna be the editor of those writings. And I said, of course. And in the dream, <laughs> In the dream, and that's the beauty of it, in the dream, I saw my name written, Paul B. Preciado, right? And then this was like so amazing for me, like to see the name written and not knowing that it's me, right? Like, and then I, I basically, I, I call this the shaman that has the Facebook, everything, I mean, and, and, and I said like, I had this dream and it, the name was Paul, this cannot be possible. <laughs> <laughs> This is a Catholic name. It's like this cannot be possible. It's, Paul is basically like the the general manager of communication of uh, Christianity. You know, <laughs> it's like what, what am I gonna do? And um, and she said to me like, well, you wanted a name, and you 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 know you asked for one in the ritual, so you have it. That's your name. Wow, that's that's really that's quite a dream. I'm like. <laughs> Feeling worried about my own dreams now, which rarely include well, the last writings of Karl Marx. I might well, add. but this is not happening all the time. That okay, happened, good, like good. you know, like what, then I'm in, worried. Yes, yeah. no, no, that happened, and this is how basically how I, I accepted the name, yeah. precisely because before when I was wait, waiting for a name or looking for one, and uh, the Comandante Marcos from from Chapas, uh, from the Zapatistas, actually uh, he left his name. Uh, and decided to take another name of someone that had been killed in the community. And then when I saw him uh, giving his name up, I thought, I can take this name. And actually, what people don't know in those conversations on, on this kind of uh, anti, let's say, anti-colonial uh, critique of uh, what they don't know is that I was in, in dialogue with the, the Zapatistas and that I asked them before, like I said to them like, would you mind if I take this name? And they said like, no, take it. Uh, is that, it's fun, why not, you know, because also, I mean, if, if you know the way Comandante Marcos has been working and the whole Chiapas idea precisely of the mask and the name being like a, something that is collectively constructed, something that I can give you, I give you the name and you take it and then you put it on your face and you use it. And then if we, you know, imagine that all of us suddenly we will have the same name what that would be for the state. That's what the, that's what the Chiapas people are doing. They're saying like, well, you want my face as a sign of my identity. What, you know, you have colonizers, you, you want to identify us, you want, you, you say that we're like indigenous, that are, okay, we have the mask, now who are we, right? So I think that this is a very, for me, it's a, it's extremely strong a statement politically as well, which is at the, is the opposite of identity politics, Facebook, uh, selfie, and the whole crap, which is basically is anti-face, no face, mm -hmm. right? The state will not, will not be able to, try, to trace us. I mean, there are a lot of artists working on, on that as well, right? But so I asked them and I said, like, can I take this name? Of course, it was on my side, it was pretentious, it was utopian, you know me, I mean, hello, uh, you know. So I, and I wanted also, but it was also the, the fear of, of not having a name and the, uh, 
I think, I think the aspiration of having a name that can salter you, you know, that you can take and that, that you can get into and, and walk with. And so I felt like so safe within that name. But then with, when the critiques came up, I, I said, of course, you know, I'm from Spain, come on. I mean, it's ridiculous, well, I'm, I'm, I look white. Uh, so it's, this is not a good name for me. So I, I, I started the, the no name issue, not having name, and then this is how I accepted at the end. And just like to, to finish the story of the dreams, so that was like, that was, that was so important that after that moment, I said to myself, never again, science, psychoanalysis, um, psychiatric discourse will take one of my dreams. Never. I mean, under my dead body, never. No. So, you know, my dreams, I, I, I stick to them. I want to know exactly what they are talking about. And, and then there's someone else in the room that actually uh, is a friend of mine, Dominique Gonzalez Foster, who's a, uh, an artist and a good friend. And by, by then we were not really as good friends as we are now. We just met. And then uh, actually, uh, but she has a work that is called Exotourism, which is basically, you know, precisely about the cosmos. And then I had a dream where she was in the dream. And in the dream, because of my nomadic condition of being always traveling and so on, uh, I had uh, an apartment on each planet, but it was a, a terif ter terrible suffering because I, I was like constantly moving from one place to the other one and always like, you know, never like being able to stay in one place. And in the dream, Dominique said to me like, well, I think, I mean, let's be realist, Paul. I think that you should keep the Venus apartment, keep the Mark's apartment, but please close the Uranus. I mean, it's so it's so far away. Close it, and that will give you like more free time, you know. And but the problem is that after having that dream, of course, imagine that you tell that dream to the uh, to a psychoanalyst, you know, like you know, and I don't know, maybe they get into property uh, discussions, anus. maybe. Okay. Anus, yeah. exactly, right. exactly. Then you got into all all things, right? But then the issue is that 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 dream became like uh, it was so uh, beautiful, and it went much beyond the knowledge that I have of the cosmos. That I thought this is ridiculous, you know. In in ordinary kind of awake life, I have no idea how the cosmos is is basically a structure, and I don't pay attention to that. But in the dream was very precise, right? So I thought, why I cannot let go of this uh, Uranus apartment? And then, of course, the whole genealogy of the uh, political struggles of the non-binary, I mean, how many non-binary writers, non-binary activists have been trying to really like fight against the, uh, the taxonomy of identity and the binary regime. And I thought, well, that's what the Uranus apartment is, right? And that's why at the end I decided to, to call that the, the book this way. Also, I guess as, as a, in a sense, it's also an homage to, uh, to all those, because sometimes we also have the impression that things now are so different that they used to be, but for me, I mean, I'm more like a kind of a historian of sexuality in reality, and I like to think uh, not just in cosmological terms, but also in kind of long span history terms. So thinking about the transformations of sexuality and identity and, and subjectivity from the 15th century, for instance, up to now, and then you see that the struggles that we are in probably started like really long ago. So basically from the beginning of the 20th century has been a very intense, important a struggle, political, aesthetically uh, a struggle against the binary regime. And this is, is I think, is, is a... a a critical and a political tradition that we can reclaim. And I think instead of, for instance, like constantly, like basically like getting rid of everything, I mean, we don't even know our own history. Come on, we, we have not been taught our own history. This history has been like ripped off from us by the university, by the museum, by we have been objectivized, right? So we're not gonna let go of the history that we don't even know. I think we have, on the contrary, we need to bury, and I think that that's part of the, for instance, you are an archeologist of the present. That's what uh, um, Jack does an amazing way, like basically like looking at the uh, history, but now like happening in the films that are like being, uh, or series, 
kinds of or, or, or whatever, all kinds of, of things that are being produced. And I'm just doing the same, but basically in a much more retrospective and, and historical way. But you know, uh, one time Paul and I taught a seminar together in Paris. It was a very ill-fated seminar for very many reasons, um, <laughs> including the fact that no one seemed to know about it. And we had, you know, three lost souls sort of wander in. Um, and a, a crook running the whole thing, but so no, I, I, I think that, that that deserves an, an explanation. I think some someone thought that he would do a lot of money, like putting yeah. us together to teach a seminar, but right. he, he forgot to but, market it. But, but first, he, uh, because he was he, he was, was basically just like a. A complete. Uh, was a huckster. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. He was right? a con man. So he, then he couldn't he couldn't promote it because then people would discover who he was. Right. That's true. So there That's we true. were, like teaching. A, 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 this we're is in the, the Sandra Pompidou teaching yes, this amazing seminar. The queerest, the queerest seminar because Ever. no amazing. one was there. <laughs> right, and no one was there. It was ridiculous. Um, but I would I would give a seminar on the reading of the day. You know, a little pedestrian, but you, you know, trying to get people involved. So then the first day Paul did a seminar, I was like, okay, no, it's great. It's great to be in a seminar. You get, you know, you also get to learn, not just teach. So two and a half la hours later, we have a whiteboard full of, y you know, all kinds of things. We, I think we started in 1492. And then he says, two and a half hours later, he says, well, tomorrow we'll talk about the 16th century. And I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, we really had only managed one century. And that, it, it is true, Paul, actually unusually in queer theory, doesn't just read one period and look deeply into it. He reads for these historical shifts. And so two questions about that. Um, one is just, you know, how do you, how do you make up an archive across such a, a massive duration? Um, maybe even three questions. Uh -huh. But second, what are the dangers of doing that kind of long-range durational study? Is it possible that you will think that something has been going on for a very long time, but in fact the versions of it are so different? The versions of sexuality in the 14th century, the 17th century, and the 19th century don't actually have much uh, to do with each other. Um, and, yeah, and then just, you know, wh what are... Yeah, what, what I know the that benefits? this is what are the problems? this is a kind of a big discussion that we have here for a long time. But I also think it's, it's, it's about the way we understand or the way I understand philosophy. Okay, that for me is for me is is, is fiction. It's fiction. Philosophy for me is fiction making. But unlike other fictions, uh, philosophy is like a mock-up of reality that has the possibility, has to be tested. In a sense, it, it, it can look like sometimes like scientific uh, theories as well, that are like a small mock-ups of reality that have to be tested, right? That's, that's the particular kind of fiction that I think philosophy is. And for me, uh, of course, I, I, because of being uh, from Spain and whatever, I, I studied with the, with the Jesuits, okay? So you, I think that this will, now you will you look at me and you, you understand Paul, Catholic, exactly. Jesuit. Yes, yes, yes. No, that, because this Jesuit thing comes back to me sometimes, even in the way I wear and everything. It's, it's the very, hair it's, shirt. It's that very, kind of it's very thing, dangerous. Yeah. The, the, but, but what is true is that basically, um, because I was uh, my my background in philosophy is also uh, basically like in even for instance in medieval philosophy was very strong and I studied like Latin and Greek and things like that. I realized at a certain point that uh, only like for instance who are the voices? Who are the people that are uh, basically recognized? publicly as philosophers having the right to tell the long story, the, the big narrative, right? Who are those voices? So basically what you have is either like the communist uh, fellows that are extremely, I mean, I'm not gonna get into big details, but like let's say Zizek, uh, Alain Badiou, so you have these, these strong male heterosexual white voices uh, speaking really like, you know, with, for me, from the, uh, the epistemology of the gender, race, and sex sexual binary uh, and nevertheless making the big the big narrative right like starting from the I mean from the caves if we could okay let's say we go 
of course, you also have uh, all the people that have like relinquished the, the big narrative for, for different reasons. Like, of course, and I studied myself with Derrida, and Derrida was part of precisely like uh, getting rid of and being very aware of the dangers of, of the big narrative. But I, I'm more like, like, in a sense, like in that, that respect, like more like a Donna Haraway, or like, if you want to put it, like Ursula Le Guin, who is someone that has been influential for you as well. Like, basically, that they need to have like counter fictions that uh, would allow us to read through history differently, right? So I'm not claiming, for instance, um, and in that respect, I'm more like a, f a philosopher of the history of sexuality, if you want, as other people would be like philosophers of the history of science. That's the way I'm looking at things, and I'm not, if, if I get in a discussion with someone that is a specialist on the 14th century, of course they will go very much into the detail and they would say like, well, what you are saying is like so imprecise. Well, yes, there is nothing more non-precise than the history of sexuality of Foucault, for instance. It's like unbelievably imprecise. I mean, there is like part, of, I mean, really no archive or, or what is the, where is the archive of what are the, use, the uses, yeah. exactly, what are the uses of that archive, right? For instance, how could it be that like the, the historian, the main historian of sexuality that we have within the queer, in, in queer narratives, I'm not even speaking now of like heterosexual binary narratives, but in queer narratives, which is the history of sexuality of Foucault, I mean, someone that never used the notion of gender, probably didn't, didn't even consider that notion important. There is no reference whatsoever to female bodies other than just as a uterus and reproduction and barely, barely, barely no discussion of it. No reference to the colonial archive, no reference to coloniality, even though he's right in front France. So he had like, I mean, come on, it was like sitting down on a volcano, right? So, uh, so I think that like a new, a new uh, this is what I'm doing now, for instance, at the, at the Pompidou Center. I'm trying to do a new history of sexuality. And of course, this is, it will be, uh, there will be like many things that will not be precise, and I love to, to work with a, a team of 20 or uh, whatever, like, you know, historians of different periods of sexuality that will come and do other things, but I'm not trying to do that. that. What I'm trying to think is basically uh, what for me now becomes like more and more clear than, even more clear than when we taught that seminar together, and even when I was writing those pieces that you find on the apartment on Uranus, which is the fact that I'm I'm now fully convinced that the uh, binary epistemology, the gender, sexual, binary epistemology, race epistemology, normal pathological epistemology that we are still working with at so many levels is collapsing. And had started to collapse already at the beginning of the 20th century, right? And for instance, the problem is that we have disregarded, um, let's say, queer, non-binary accounts of sexuality. For instance, as those as Magnus Isfer, Ischfeld, who opened the, the first like uh, institute for the study of sexuality uh, in Germany that was like burned by, by the Nazis. So in a sense, the whole history of the 20th century, including Nazism, including the atomic bomb, including the reform of democracy that we have known, could also be read as a way of trying to keep and fix this binary regime, which is what the colonial patriarchal mode of production that we know, that is capitalism, needs to effectively work. But that is not really working anymore. And that whose uh, consequences in terms of bio, biopolitics, but also necropolitics, basically like the use of techniques of violence as strategies of government are now touching the limit of what is possible, right? So, and I think that that's, I, in, in, you might think that I'm crazy, but that's the way I think, what can I do? You know, it's like, it, you have to accept what the, the way that you see things and embrace them and, and uh, sometimes from Uranus, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, like looking at things from, even from outside the earth and, and then suddenly looking at the, the span of the life of this planet and what has happened to it, right? 
which is very long, and in that in that span of time, queer history is like you know is is almost nothing. But might be the the symptom precisely of the the transformation, the shift from a binary epistemology into something else, something that is not there yet, but that is coming, that is right. is being. I think it's being constructed, it's being done effectively within the practices of many of us that are already living non-binary lives. Right. And but this is a utopian uh, no, dream I don't, again because... No, I don't see could, it as utopian. You could say, and this is the kind of question that y yes. you've asked me in the past, whether uh, we're, we're in a post-binary world sort of happily for capitalism and that bi binarism has long since ceased to be the supporting system um, for the structures of exploitation and extraction and in fact have already been replaced by I know, multiplicity I know. Yes. and in fact the, the, you, you know you look in the mm -hmm. US uh, the, 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 the media embrace of Trans Jack, tipping points. For I'm example. not. I'm not saying that the shift that is taking place is going to be for the best. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying it in a sounds no, no, way. no. What I'm saying, it, anyway. I mean, it could go, yeah. well, what I'm saying is that epistemologically, uh, we are going through an epistemic shift that is only, uh, can only be comparable with the transformation that happened between the 15th century and the 17th century, with the invention of the printing press, with the moving from an oral culture into a culture of writing, uh, with the uh, expansion of colonialism, both to the Americas and to the East, um, with the invention of the notions of masculinity and femininity as anatomical categories with the invention of race as a political technique of management of parties. That is a, a kind of a, a whole epistemology that has started in the 15th century, and that's why I have this obsession. I think the 15th century is, is, is fascinating and is super important for us to understand that we are now going through a very similar shift, for instance, moving from a culture of writing into the culture of the internet, yeah. right? So the, the, the printing press, without the printing press, you have the, is colonialism as we know it was not possible. It was so important, for instance, that the printing press was taken to Colombia. It was m even more important than coming with the ships, right? So now it's exactly the same. The, the ship that is happening is including robotization, artificial intelligence, uh, biotechnologies, pharmacological control of subjectivity, uh, surveillance at all different levels, from the app level to the micro level. This transformation, that's what I'm, what I'm saying, Jack, is not, I'm not saying that this is gonna, we're going from a binary regime into a queer regime, absolutely not. What I'm saying is that the, the, what is happening, and that's what I like to use the notion of transition, not just in terms of transitioning as gender transitioning, but as a technical, philosophical term to really think about this epistemological shift. And the thing is that exactly like, for instance, in the 16th century, for instance, in the 16th century, what is happening is that people that are saying that uh, the, uh, the earth is turning around the sun, are being burned, right, alive. Because they are considered like basically, well, this, this cannot happen, right? Of course, basically 30 years after, you will have the implementation of Newtonian physics. You will have Galilee, Galilee that has already said like, well, I was, I, I was, I'm sorry, I was wrong. He will say like, well, in reality, I think I was right, right? Okay, so that's the paradigm sh shift. And I think that what, what is interesting for me, instead of like being like completely into the, the kind of a gay and lesbian politics, and I'm saying gay and lesbian and not even trans or, or, um, or queer politics, but really like gay and lesbian politics, like looking more, more or less more to the, the politics of life and death, right? To the how uh, life and death has been managed within this planet that is the earth, and that is the only condition that would allow for a certain identity. And this we go back to the discussions that we've been having with Dominique. That's why Uranus is important, and that's why 
aliens are important. But yeah, I, if we're going into <laughs> aliens, I think we have to bring the audience in. Speaking of aliens, yeah. so is, uh, you know that is super yeah. late. Yeah, yes. super yeah. super late. So uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions. Do you guys have a mic you're going to bring around? Somebody very eager up here. Maybe you have somebody at the back. Yeah. So maybe we take like uh, two or three questions maximum. Yeah. Yeah. There's one here. Yes, you are. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Certainly the only one. Uh, yeah. No. yeah. So, so what <laughs> Eager and unique. Thank you, both of you. You're both like heroes of mine, so I'm really excited. Um, I had a question, sort of. Um, so I'm uh, obviously, I'm really inspired by this idea of like sort of transcending time and, and being in a, um, what was it? Uh, Political pornographic, no, pharmaco 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 pharma pharmacopornographic yeah. sort of Regime, age. Yeah. And I, when I read your book, Testo Junkie, that really inspired me thinking about the idea of biohacking and bodily mm -hmm. autonomy and how we can sort of claim that and how empowering that is. Like, so personally, it's been quite an empowering journey of me, for me to sort of think about um, gaining bodily autonomy. But I don't, I want to know, Paul, what you think about sort of the uh, current laws uh, in the UK, for example, like uh, tongue splitting and nipple removal and certain sort of um, uh, BDSM practices are being banned, you know, starting from, uh, I think, August 2018, tongue splitting was banned, but like a number of uh, sexual practices for queer people are quite are banned as well. The and internet, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, social no. media. But even in terms of like the actual practice of BDSM, like certain BDSM practices. Not just on the internet, yeah. but on but, the... But, but in, in terms of legally speaking, yeah. and I just yeah. wanted to think about how that sort of, um, you know, it, it gets into, you know, uh, Essentially, well, well, BDSM is not life and death, but it does affect the way that people fuck, and you know, what well, uh, the, the way you know the way we're living our lives in terms of like you know um, the pursuit Maybe of pleasure. Maybe ask a question. Yeah, so I just wanted to know what he thought about that and how we can kind of resist it, or like how we can—is it gonna just fade out? You know, this sort of. Um, yeah, maybe maybe Jack might have uh, something you to know? say about that as well because you you know uh, British politics better than than no no no, no? okay but I, bre is it, is I it Brexited like a whatever a while or back. do we do we do we do something or like no, what, what's well, your stance? first I think the the internet that as I was saying before is one of the key uh, technologies to the the shift that is uh, happening. Nevertheless, as we many times discuss with with uh, Jack as well, for instance, I'm I'm. I'm very puzzled and somehow sometimes surprised about the the role that, uh, let's say, for instance, Facebook and Instagram and other like uh, social media are uh, taking within, let's say, minority politics or you know anti anti racist or trans feminist politics, um, in a sense that. Um, I understand the instrumental use of them, and yes, but how could it be that uh, a kind of a, a technical society like we are, extremely technical society like we are, uh, my trust, I uh, give all its, its trust and its political language uh, to certainly like companies that are like they, they belong to Google and Microsoft. I mean, this is something that I am not. I am not a hacker. I don't have like the the lo the knowledge that I that I could have. Like for instance, I, I was working on a on a project last year and going very often to Taiwan, and I realized that uh, I I was really like a. Basically, I didn't have the knowledge that I need to have, and I was super surprised about the uh, the, the knowledge that the young generations uh, have about, for instance, um, just programming. That someone that doesn't know how to program is like just someone like doesn't know how to read in the in the 17th century. And yes, I think it's true, and I think this is something that as as a political community, uh, and now I'm. Talking about the community of living bodies as as a kind of submental political struggle, we should reappropriate critically 
those technologies. I don't. I cannot imagine that we can have like basically uh, Facebook or Instagram deciding if we have nipples on internet. This is. Um, it seems to me that this is unbelievable. And also, um, my second contention is that I. I believe that. If thinking about what happened in the in the 15th century and how censorship work and so on, maybe what we know now as an open space within the uh, within the internet won't last very long, and we will look back and say like, wow, you know, at the beginning of the 2000s, these people they could do more or less what what they, what they wanted on the internet, right? Sorry, I'm saying um, it's actually illegal to remove someone's nipple, physical nipple. Oh, you mean physically? I thought. Oh, sorry. Oh, you can't split your tongue and you can't remove someone's nipple. You mean physically, physically? Oh, has a piercing thing. Oh, but okay. You know, if you're if you're applying some of Paul's okay. theories, okay. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry because I I completely misunderstood your point. I thought I thought you were you were speaking you were speaking digitally since basically this kind of a uh, eraser of, of the body is is happening all all the time. Well, I guess that. What what is inter interesting in relation to the BD sim um, discussion is um, how much attention is being given, for instance, to violence that is happening within minority movements in a very consensual way and a very technical and decided way, and how little attention is being given, for instance, to uh, mm, just very extensive violent, real violence, I would say, that is happening institutionally, uh, both within the political regime of heterosexuality, but also, for instance, within institutions like family and so on, right? So I think that the, the, what we call violence, I think some of these words that we use, this is, for instance, one of the problems that I have, even with the notion of body, that I'm now trying not to use and to basically use other notions, like, like somatic apparatus, for instance, like that is but they would be like much much more complex than the body and i think that with violence is the same i think that we should speak about uh, techniques of violence and not violence and then go into very detail uh thinking about which ones what what are those techniques how are they implemented on what particular um skins on which bodies how you know so basically i think that we have to kind of go down into the understanding of of what violence is instead of always like speaking about violence. Right. I mean this is you, you know completely in line with what you've been asking us to do which is to break out of an identity politics where we look for the next group that's been marginalized and instead think in structural ways uh, about the the particular intervention that's being made. It's not about just oh the poor S BDSM community they're now being targeted. Lots of people are being targeted, what regimes of violence target which people, and why do they sometimes, for example, as they did this week in Germany, erupt into these very individualized forms that wreak punishment, like the, the right-wing uh, gunman in Germany who expresses his rage by killing strangers, something that happens all too, ho too often in the US. What violences are channeled through those kinds of bodies? versus what consensual kinds of activities are being played out. That's the division, that, that's the shift, right? And look how hard it is for us to get out of the identity politic uh, vocabulary, which is why I think Paul's saying, think in terms of somatic techniques. Don't keep thinking about bodies, identities, this group, that group, who has been harmed, which person. That's not the question mm -hmm. of the big projects that Paul asks us to pay attention to. Maybe one or two more questions. We have one here and now one there are many. Suddenly, yeah. there are many questions, and maybe we are not able to take all of them, unfortunately. Hi, thank you. Um, it's a quick question. So, just to disclose, I actually I practice psychoanalysis, so I'm off the, the jokes. Um, and my question: I read your um, speech in Paris to the bourgeois psychoanalysts, and I agree with it very much. That psychoanalysis is part of this creation of a certain kind of modern individual. But in light of uh, this epistemological change you're talking about just today, I wonder, you know, ontologically, how can we account within this new change, this new world? How can we account for psychic suffering? How can we account for psychosis, for anxiety? Absolutely. So how do, you th how do you think of that in this, within this new epistemology, you know, this 
your topic of future epistemology, how do you think these things? I struggle a lot to think that. Yeah. So I wonder what you, you're thinking. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, she's referring to, uh, it would be very long to, to explain, but basically I was invited to an annual meeting of the uh, Society of Psychoanalysts in France, and they're like 3,500. They gathered together almost in a football um, place. I mean, it was a, it's a Palais de Congrès, a really big place. And uh, so really, I, um, I w for me, it was, a, again, it was a, the manifesto thing, but it was, uh, I think it was also the important thing for me was basically uh, to speak from the position of the the one that is not supposed to speak and produce knowledge about himself or herself or themselves. Uh, some of us, some of our bodies uh, have been historically constructed as precisely just the object of knowledge or violence. And I think that what psychoanalysts doesn't accept is basically someone from that position, even from the one that is suffering, psychological suffering from the psychiatrically ill, to basically produce a knowledge about himself, herself, themselves, and speak to them about it and try to think about it collectively. Right? So instead of that, uh, psychoanalysis go, goes much more into a very privatized, I think it's an interesting thing because it's, if you think about the, uh, the um, coach condition, right? like I said, you go into the house of someone, you go into an apartment, which is precisely not an apartment on Uranus, and you go into, a, 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 let's say, a bourgeois uh, configuration, architectural con configuration, where a certain room has been made particularly silent and calm, and then you sit across someone, one to one, the other person is lying, and then you speak, and someone is interpreting or saying something or trying to understand, but those words are privatized, right? Like basically, it's, it's, it remains is supposed to remain, even though the psychoanalyst has the right to produce knowledge, but not not you, right? So, uh, for me, in that in that occasion, was very important to uh, speak from the position of the monster and say, like, the monster is uh, speaking back, which is something that is, uh, you know, it's a kind of an ongoing tradition for us as well, the the, the non-binary bodies and so on. So it was important to say. Um, we are not just the object of therapy, we are not just the object of, of, uh, of knowledge, but we are also producing a knowledge about ourselves, and this knowledge has to do precisely with trying to build collectively and think collectively the transformation of this binary regime into something else. And we have like several choices. Either, I mean, at least for the psychoanalyst, either you remain within the identity and taxonomical frame of the 19th century with a little bit of pharmacological and discursive here and there, like salt and pepper, okay, right? And either you do, for instance, doing by Skype your psychoanalyst, which is good, right? It's like, it's another way of like, a, that, the, the digital code, coach, couch that, uh, that, you could, that you could do. Either you do that, but you do not question the epistemological framework that you're working with, or I'm not saying psychoanalysis should die, on the contrary, or you m take the position of really like crossing to a different regime with some of us that are already living non-binary lives, right? So, which I think, for, I think is the majority of the population in reality, in the sense that uh, binary lives as they are supposed to be um, existing according to this very uh, strict colonial and patriarchal ideology are impossible to, to embody, right? So for me, that, that was the, the challenge on, on speaking to the psychoanalyst. And now this text, uh, I, I, because the text was basically like uh, rewritten by people that were in the in the audience and was like circulating wildly without me like correcting it or anything. It was like quite crazy, even though I couldn't really like say the full text because the psychoanalysts were like, "Well, finish quickly," and you know. So now I'm. This text is coming out uh, in French and Spanish, and eventually, uh, apparently, my editor said that in English as well soon. So so you will be able to read it and to to judge by yourselves what I'm what I'm proposing and then I think it's um, then the, the practices the of taking care are to be invented 
but certainly I don't think we, keep, we can keep working either with the, the Pinus MB, either with the, um, uh, you know, the castration with active, passive, with heterosexuality and homosexuality, with the family paradigm, with uh, the Oedipus complex, I think that we need to invent a new grammar for taking care of what really is happening. And I, I don't know if I have the time. Okay, I, I'm gonna give myself the time because I think it's super <laughs> important. <laughs> if you allow are we, me are to. Are we okay, Sarah? Where's yes, Sarah? If, you, if you allow me to, I think it's very, very important for psychoanalysts to start hearing where the suffering is coming from instead of constantly interpreting, for instance, a child is saying, oh, I've been abused. It's like, well, but there's a deepest complex. So, you know, it's like, in a sense, every child desires his parents. It's like, where this is coming from, that every child desires his, his parents, who actually blame Oedipus for being in love with his mother. It's like, has anyone really read the Oedipus story? Oedipus was not in love with his mother, right? First, he didn't know he was, it was his mother, right? Like, so the story is, is, is to be like fully reread, but I think it's super important that uh, psychoanalysts, if they want to really move towards the, the new epistemology with some of us, or they, they want to remain within the disciplinary regime, whatever they can do, that if they want to come to this new epistemology, I think that they have to pay attention to the voices that are claiming that violence has been done to them and that the suffering is there. So the suffering is not in the, in the family, the suffering is not the father that is suffering, no, the suffering, something else has happened. And I think that until now, I don't really see psychoanalysts being able to take into account, like for instance, uh, women's, the violence that women's bodies have, have been the object of historically and institutionally, and the violence of which children's bodies have been the object of, right? And the gender and sexual violence that come hand in hand, not to talk about racial violence. I have to say that in 3,500 3, psychoanalysts, not a single one was non-white, not a single one, right? So basically, and of course, they're not expecting to anyone that is not white to have anything to say. Otherwise, they will send it to ethno-psychiatric. You know, so, well, okay. So I think that there are many, many issues that have to be talked about. But maybe we are already running super late, and I think she's going to resign. I think as a psychoanalyst. Oh no, no, no. On the no, contrary, no, no, on the no. My contention is that there are a lot of psychoanalysts that are working, yeah. that are working against the psychoanalytical theory, but they are not yet able to say it publicly. So you have to speak up, yeah. right? Okay, and listen. I, maybe we, this is the end. We'll take. Uh, there were two more hands. One there, one here. So we'll take. We'll listen to both questions. You give a very quick... Uh, okay, you, you ask the questions, I will not say anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take both. We just listen to the questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And, and pe please be brief. Yeah, I, f I first came across your work because I come to a reading group here. Um, I've been in the psychiatric system for a long time. I see um, psychoanalysis really as a parasite profession which colonizes people's experience. And I thought that your suggestion would um, allow them to recuperate themselves and retain their power. Um, it's very difficult for us to find our subjectivity because through many decades, we've had many forms of, of behavioral ideas and models of understanding imposed upon us so that when we try and describe our, our subjective experience in our own words, we cannot find a language within which to describe it. Um, if you've been in the system for a long time, you'll, you internalize a lot of these ideas and it's very difficult to think outside of them because it's a form of kind of, of architecture which is imposed upon you. I, and when I came to the reading group and your work was discussed, I, f I felt that something should be said about psychiatric violence, but not only psychiatric violence, the whole psy system, psychology, psychotherapy, psychiatry, it's all, it's all the same form of domination, but not only that, is, is it kind of 
puts itself up as having a, mon a monopoly on um, explaining human consciousness. Very nicely said. Okay, we'll take... Thank you. Yeah, I don't need to add anything. Thank yeah. you for the, for the comment. Thank There's you so one much. one person there with final comment. So you made an intriguing comment that lesbian identity might be in some sense an exception, and I was wondering if you could explain that. Well, that's a big, it's a big thing for last. I mean, no, no, what I, I, I think that, that, uh, that lesbianism, precisely because of the position of being outside of heterosexuality, but also, in a sense, denying the principle of a, uh, um, femaleness in relation, its definition in relation to masculinity, um, has been very difficult to track within these taxonomies and very difficult to digest by the system and to become, to try and, and transform into something productive. And this has been, I mean, Jack knows much better because I think he's really a, a theorist of these, like you've been tracking these, the, the movement I think also within popular culture and media and so on. And now, well, it, within the last maybe 10 years, it's been like a, a stronger effort to kind of recuperate and shape and form the lesbian identity within the media. But I think that lesbians for me are like a little bit like Greek people that I, that I love, which is whatever you give to them, they say no. You know? <laughs> and yes, the, you know, so that the lesbian in me will always be alive saying no to whatever, you know? It's like, and that's something else that I, I reclaim. I mean, I reclaim, I, 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 of course I'm a trans man now, but I also reclaim my uh, lesbian culture, my lesbian uh, mm, genealogy, the lesbian knowledge that I have, and I don't need, I'm not uh, disgusted by someone that will put me in a relationship with a lesbian. I mean, it's, what is that? I mean, it was all my life, come on. And it's, that's the, the political kind of resistance that has constructed me, so yeah. That's what I have to say. You heard it, heard it here, here first. A lesbian uh, revival is, is coming your way. Um, so let me just thank Paul. Um, I, I do want to state the obvious, uh, which is that it's really great of Paul to come and speak to us in English. He, he participates in academic life in French, English, Spanish. It's really unusual, really amazing. Um, we all came very late to his work precisely because many English speakers are monolingual. These books were around for a good, I don't know, almost eight years before they were translated uh, into English, some of them, 20 years for the manifesto. So uh, we're here to really celebrate Paul, thank Paul, um, and I hope we're all going to go into the world more utopian than we came in. Thank so, you, Jack. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And It's, wow. It's really, it's really amazing. I just like to give you back some of the amazing thing that you have done now for me. And uh, I, I, I hope that you could, that you realize that you are really like a, a, a a parliament by yourself, by being here, and that when I'm not here, for instance, you can equally meet together and start thinking about these practices of transformation. And I hope that that, that you do, and even reclaim the spaces like this one to, to do that. Uh, so thank you so much.